Gym Center. Um, so reading the Gym Center, we don't formally teach it, but we do a lot of things that support it. And of course, if a student is already reading, we take them as they are and we differentiate the curriculum so that they can continue on. Um, we do daily read-alouds of fiction, non-fiction, fairy tales, folk tales, poetry, you name it, newspapers, magazines, anything that we can get our hands on that helps um, with our theme or what we're studying. Uh, the Delphi really does a lot of acting out of finger plays, nursery rhymes, itsy bitsy spider, those fun things that get them moving. Um, we play silly word games with rhyming and nursery rhymes and finger plays as well. Uh, we act out adult author books. And a lot of the books we act out, I brought some here, um, we like to turn into story baskets so that the students can go and take the book themselves and read um, as they use any type of stuffed animal, something that represents all the elements of the story after we've acted it out. So Five Little Monkeys is definitely a favorite in our classrooms. Um, we also dictate stories that we act out as a group. So a student will come to me, tell me any type of story they want. We make it a big production. They assign characters to all the people that are in their story. They pull these characters from their classmates. And then we create a stage in the middle of our room and we act it out. It's really fun. We don't use props. We don't use costumes. It's just all up to their imagination. So, And then we also um, do dictated stories with their artwork. So we might do a book study. Recently we did The Dot. I don't know if y'all know that. I should have a picture of it. But basically it's about a child that uses dots to create artwork. So then from there the children created their own artwork using circles and dots of all kinds. And they created a story based on that. And I had some that were talking about roller coasters. I mean it is completely up to whatever they want their story to be. And with the stories, we do not correct their grammar. We offer a suggestion. So a lot of my students will say, he goed to sleep. And I'll repeat it back. I'll say, well, would you like it to be he went to sleep or he go to sleep? And whatever they say back, that is what you write. A lot of times they'll pick the correct word use, but if they don't, that's fine. It's their words, so we want to validate that. Um, we also do journal entries in pre-K, so they will write or draw anything they'd like at all. Right now we're doing the pumpkin elf, so a lot of my kids have been doing journal entries about the pumpkin elf. And then we just ask a simple sentence or two about what their journal is, giving them validation to what they've drawn. And so they're always watching us, that's kind of the main key in Jones Center, we're modeling that words will turn in to something that can be read, that can, then can be acted out, or, you know, it's just, it, it gives meaning to it. Um, we teach the letters and the sounds associated with the letters. We focus mainly on capital letters. <coughs> Kindergarten gets a little bit more into the lowercase and all of that, but they've had a blast with that, and we've even incorporated it into our show and tell, so that each week we have a letter of the week, and so the students really learn how this beginning sound can be found in so many words that they use or things that are around the house or something that's meaningful for the, like, to them. So it's, it's really neat to see what they come up with. Um, again, we mainly try just to give the students a lot of opportunities to play with the sounds and create words and kind of explore with it. And then in pre-K, we do the Happily Ever After program. So we start with a big book reading, and we show them that it starts with just picture books. So they're learning that picture books don't necessarily have words, but they do tell a story. Um, then they make their own, their own version of the book. And then from that, or not version, they make their own copy of the book, sorry. From that we do a bunch of leading, listening, comprehension worksheets that leads into the Super Kids program that I believe the rest of the grades use. So this is kind of a precursor to Super Kids. 
So the other day, my students made La Tortuga because we were studying La Tortuga. So in Happily Ever After, they mainly focus on folk tales. So last week we did The Three Little Bears. Um, I think next we're doing the, shoe, the Elves and the Shoemaker. Um, so yeah, they'll be circling, underlining, just trying to draw from what they learned from the book to make sure that they kind of got the key elements of the book and what was going on. So that is Reading in the Jones Center. <laughs> We can do two things. We can have a kind of questions from that, if anyone has any short questions, and then we're going to have a big Q&A session at the end, okay? So there's some note cards and pens on your table, so if you see, if you hear something, you want to ask a question, we, I think it's better if we save it to the end, because then the different people can answer your specific question. And it may come up as we go through the next, the next part of the presentation. Is that okay with everyone? So you have some pens, there's some note cards, just note that. Oh, and I'm doing the, this program through Rice right now, the Ella program, and this book is wonderful. If you have small children, if you, I mean, even through kindergarten or first grade, it's called Maddie, Reading Magic by Mem Fox. And it, it's, a, I read it in a day. It's a quick read, but it just shows you the importance of reading aloud. And it, it talks about dad's reading too, which I really loved, and how important it can be, and just ways to do it. So this is an awesome resource. I'm leaving it up here if anyone wants to look at it. Will you say the title again? Reading Magic by mm -hmm. Mem Fox. Thank you. And she does wonderful <laughs> um, children's books as well. She's been around for forever. <laughs> and we're also gonna, I'm, as you say, I'm filming, but we're also gonna, we have on our Jones Center Lower School Parrot page, there's um, a ta in the topic section, each coffee has gonna have its own section where you can watch the video and any of the links to websites, books, resources will all be found there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Any well, we'll wait for questions till the end, so thank you, Ellie. Oh, wait, oh, and I did pictures. Oh, oh yeah, should I see, yeah. let's see our home center friends. <laughs> so this is Delphi. Um, Delphi acts out books as well. This is them acting out caps for sale. We try to make our libraries as cozy as possible with lovies and tons of books. Um, and again, uh, they do a lot of the finger plays. They are doing uh, stories with each art piece, but they kind of only range from like a sentence or two. But just kind of showing them that the words have meaning and that they can connect with what they're doing. This is pre-K. We have uh, mystery readers that come once a week. It's really fun for them. Uh, this is my kiddos doing journals, lots of puppets in my classroom so that they can also retell different kinds of stories along with story baskets. They're doing a story basket over here. We act out lots of books and then this is me taking a story with Mr. Jacob. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, for reading in kindergarten we basically build on the pre-K and the Delphi programs. They uh, Pre-K said they had happily ever after when they get to kindergarten, it changes to super kids and they this continues through second grade with the, uh, many of the activities and the, and the characters are the same. So uh, in that program, <clears throat> it's sort of a comprehensive thing. It's, it's reading, writing, listening, speaking. And all, all those elements are built into the activities. And the kids have their own, each week or every two weeks, depending on how long each unit is, the children get a book that's linked to an alphabet letter. And we do all kinds of activities with it and uh, learning to blend those sounds. And eventually, they'll be reading words in the books. One of the big components is phonemic awareness. And, Parents can do activities with phonemic awareness. All that means, it's just sound play. You can do it in the car. You say, can you name something that begins with the book sound? And, or can you name something that has the ah sound in the middle? Or something that, uh, name a word that ends with the k. So we focus on those beginning, middle, and end sounds. It's rhyming. It's sound matching, like I just said. It's uh, sound deletion. We've just started, I play a game called Snip It, where I say, can you say the word back and snip off the book? And they'll go, ack. Well, that's 
the eventual thing they're going to say. Right now, it's sort of a difficult thing because that sort of sets them up for rhyming words, helping that you can change the beginning of words and make brand new words. You can create word families. We, uh, of course, do all letters of the alphabet and their corresponding sounds, but our big focus now is on lowercase. Many of the boys and girls don't really recognize the lowercase letters or the sounds that are associated with them. So when they're taught in the Super Kids lesson, they're linked to the capital letter that they already know from pre-K. Um, we learn, teach them to blend those sounds together where they're actually reading words. And later they can segment the sounds, taking each sound in, in the words, and they can link it to uh, a letter that makes a sound, and they're actually spelling words. And when we're writing, uh, at the beginning, we call it invented spelling or um, a temporary spelling, whatever, you know, there's a lot of terminology out there, but we take what the kids have. If it's a memory, if it's a word that we've taught, they have a source in the room to go find that word and spell it correctly. But we, we don't like, when we're writing, we don't like to clutter up their, their page with a bunch of marks that says, you got, you got this wrong because it really takes away the joy of creating those, those sentences and those ideas. Um, we also have memory words that uh, they're high frequency words, sight words, a lot of terminology for that, and they're called memory words in uh, Super Kids, where it's, we teach them to, when they just see that word, they've seen it so much, it's just a part of their memory. They can read it. They don't have to sound it out. They just know what the word is. Um, each week, we give like five or six memory words that we're going to be focusing on. And during that week, the children are working with those words. We've got books with those words embedded in them that uh, we have written especially for that group of words that the children can practice. So. Uh, you might see kids coming home with a little paper book that's stapled together, and they can, they're so excited, I can read this whole book, because it's words that they've, they've been taught and words that they recognize from the Super Kids uh, program. Uh, Super Kids also builds on comprehension and fluency skills, uh, and we use literary, or that, that's a fancy word, stories. It's stories <laughs> and information text. And it also teaches writing mechanics, the process of writing, which is very, it's, it's not a static, linear thing. It, it just goes round and round, and it's it, back and forth with, like, they might have an idea, they start it, later on they come back to it, they want to change it, they want to add something to it. So it's whatever they want to do with their stories. Right now, it's basically pictures, and they're dictating what they want to say in their story. Some, some of the kids, it, we have all different levels. Some are starting to put letters together and you can sort of read the words. Others, it's, they'll try letters, but the, to them, it's saying something. So when they dictate it to us, they actually have their story. Uh, we also focus on different types of writing. The, the narrative, uh, we have opinions, and information and explanatory text. Now, while we're teaching, we do uh, whole group lessons where they're all together, we're doing read-alouds, we're talking about the story. Probably the most important thing you can do when you're reading with your child at home is after, that while you read, before, during, and after, you're stopping and talking about it. And instead of asking short little questions like, uh, that get an, a yes or no answer, the open-ended questions are much better to build that critical thinking. What do you think? Well, what's your opinion of this? Do you think they made a good choice? The character did a good choice? Or how would you, how could we change the ending? Those kind of open-ended questions where they create ideas based on the stories that they're reading. We also do small group lessons where we're teaching whatever concept it might be. Those are my parents that are leaving because they're going to book You'll see the video and you can come yeah. back. But the lessons might be, it, it depends on the skill that we're going to teach in those small group lessons. Uh, they also have independent, partner, and group stations. We do sort of um, 
uh, a version of the Daily Five. We do the word working, the work on writing. We do listen to reading, reading to self. And then we have skilled state, we, we call them stations. And in those uh, different stations, there are all kinds of activities that are linked with literacy activities. Alphabet, reading, rhyming, sounds, uh, just whatever that we are working on at that time. Right now, we're getting ready to send home leveled home readers. We've, we've got uh, some information on our students where, what would be the best fit books for them. And to start that and get them ready, we've had them pick books to take home and have mom and dad read to them. Get them used to putting the books in the bag, taking it home, and then later bringing it back. We've got some examples of these book bags. These are, I think, what, these first grade? First grade. But our, book, our, our bags are basically the same. They're, they're not as decorated as these are. <laughs> but um, it has the children's name, and they know that they, they put their books in, they take them home, and parents read to them. Hopefully, we want our parents to realize when, them, when those books come home, it's not a one-time deal. Because we read books, the same book, over and over during the week. And especially, you know, when children are enjoying the story that mom and dad are reading to them, it's okay. It's like those fairy tales that were told to us when we were little, and they want the same story read, uh, told to them every night. It's okay to let them read that book over and over because it builds their fluency. Uh, that's the purpose. Fluency, comprehension, and expression. There's not a whole lot of times where in public that we have to read out loud to someone, but in school, they do. And so we want them to be able to read with an expressive voice that tells how the characters are feeling. They can get, it it's, it's actually comes from that story dictation when they become those characters and acting out those characters in those books. They can read with those voices. Um, comprehension, again, asking those questions about it. So uh, when books come home and they say, oh, this this book is too easy for my child. It's actually not. Those books, and, and that happens in first and second grade too, those books are leveled for their ability where we have made a professional judgment that this is what they need at this time. And those, those books change, those levels change, but at the same time, you always want to work on that comprehension. So as they read it to you, have them talk about it. Ask them to retell the story from beginning to the end. You'd be surprised how many children start out they're telling the story of Cinderella. Well, there's this little girl named Cinderella and she went to the ball and married the prince. Is that really all the story? You see, they've left out all So it's a skill they have to be taught to start at the beginning, hit the high points of the story, get to the end and tell what happened. So that's, that's the big thing that we're doing here in kindergarten. I have some photos of our friends working. This is a, the first one is a small group instruction. The teacher's working with specific students on specific skills. This is a writing station where they've, uh, they've got Halloween stickers and things to uh, spark their interest and write about. Here's uh, another uh, listening uh, to reading station, and we use the QR codes. Are y'all familiar with QR codes? They, they are linked. You can actually get them off of Pinterest, and if you have iPads at home, you can print the little cards, and the child can just scan it uh, with their iPad, and a book comes up, and they can listen to it. That's a really good thing to help them their hearing quality reading. They're hearing the expression, the fluency of the reader. This uh, photo is they're listening to reading with actual books and CD players. So they have their own book, their own CD, and they can read and they can get a choice of, of whatever books they want. In this station, it's called word working, and here they're actually working on the memory words. They're doing activities like rainbow writing. Uh, there are things, we have wiki sticks where they form the letters of the word. They work the words with Play-Doh. It's not always a paper pencil activity. And uh, 
they have opportunities to do these at home because we post it on our webpage all kinds of activities that children can engage in at home doing these same activities. Uh, these are skill stations like we've been working on rhyming so there might be puzzles not only do the children need rhyming but they also need to work know how to work puzzles and put puzzles together and it's also a, it provides a self-checking activity uh, this the middle station is sound matching we have you can buy certain activities from Lakeshore or order them from Amazon where they're they're matching it might be sounds we have beginning sounds we have ending sounds and this particular station at the end is a spelling station. There are little cubes with uh, letters written on them, and they snap them together to make words. And we're, our big focus is, is working on the memory words, so they're spelling the memory words. So lots of different ways to do all those reading and literacy activities in kindergarten, which, which is we just follow right along from our pre-K. So. First grade, we follow on from kindergarten, and we do an awful lot of what Mr. Elam has already spoken about. Um, our big thing, and for me as a teacher, the guided reading session that I have with my students is really, really important. It is when I'm working with a small group, the students are reading a text that might be related to the seasons, say, or something that we're talking about in the classroom. And when they sit down with the book, they don't open the book straight away. We look at the cover, we talk about what they see, we talk about what they can learn just by looking at the cover. We look at the genre of the text that it's going to be, and um, we make predictions. We ask them to look through the book, and um, just look, don't spend a lot of time looking at the words, trying to get clues or hints, so that they're making a prediction about the text. And it doesn't matter if their prediction is wrong, as long as it's feasible, if it's something that you know could happen. Um, if it's a non-fiction text, not, some of my students now are reading more um, elaborate texts, I would say, that are including things like glossaries, contents page, headings, index. So it's important that they read the heading in a non-fiction book so they know what that page is about. And um, I always say that they're going to, the way I use it is, they're going to be book detectives. And in this book, they're going to have to find a contents page. And if you're going, if you're reading a book, this week um, we're doing maps. So I chose a book about the mighty Mississippi. And in that book, there is a map. So we had to look at the index at the back and they had to go back and find what page the map was on. They look at the contents page and I ask them to go and find it and then I make up my own interpretation sheets so that they can, I know if they're understanding the text. If it's a storybook that we've read, we do do comprehension, but we build on the comprehension and we're now looking for them to put the story into sequence and select the main points of the story. And that is something that's quite tricky to do because there's a lot of information in a text and it's hard for them to be able to tell the story. And often they go from one bit to maybe something that happened at the end and they've forgotten what happened in the middle. So we have to go back. And what we're looking for them to do is tell the story in sequence. So that's, so guided reading, I spend probably 20 minutes with my group, maybe 25, and then set them off to do a task. It might not all get completed in one day, especially if we're doing comprehension or putting things in order, but um, it's really important and we can do it over several days and it could be incorporated into my daily five. The reading to self. Um, my students, there's a huge variety of books, and some of them like more challenging texts because they see their friends taking that. And I suggest to parents, if they do take a challenging text, you read it to your child or read it with them and take turns in reading pages. It's all right if they don't read the whole book, you can read along with them and read some of the pages. Um, listen to reading, they all love that. 
and buddy reading. Often if you ask a student, what kind of reading do you like best? They will say buddy reading, because if they're reading with a partner, their friend can help them with the text if they, they come across a tricky word. You know, that you've given them strategies to try and decode the word, but if, you know, if they can't, their friend can help them, and often they say that's why they like reading um, with a friend. Um, our word work, that's when we practice our spelling words, doing lots of different activities, exactly what Mr. Elam said. We have word searches, um, the Play-Doh writing, they love rainbow writing. And um, <coughs> I have something, it's on my own iPad, but you know, they can write and it's got a glittery pen and the girls <laughs> love that. <laughs> you know, just find a different way for getting them to practice their writing. Um, every week we read aloud a story of some sort and again, as Mr. Elam said, we read that quite frequently and we build our language work from that text. Um, and uh, we have done poetry in my class, so we've read a lot of autumn poems because the students all created their autumn poem. And um, we're, we always have a chapter book on the go in the first grade classroom. We're going to see Mr. Popper's Penguins, the play, so we're all reading that to them at the moment, which they're quite enjoying. So, And then um, there's my class. Ms. Gleason was here who grew breed. There is some buddy reading taking place and um, listening to reading. So the classroom is a busy place. There's lots going on and the children just get involved in whatever it is that um, they're doing. And there's another group. Um, and I think they were with Miss Alexander. We're really fortunate that Miss Alexander and Mrs. Corbett <coughs> is coming into our classrooms and hearing children read is super because you know, I'm sure they get fed up hearing my voice all the time. And it's nice to read with someone else who has a different tone. And often we listen to uh, books on the uh, smart board or Promethean board. So that's good. And then some children just want to go and read off by themselves, which is great. So second grade. I've got all the Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, as these guys have all said, we continue the on from second uh, from first grade and what they do. Um, we teach our reading in whole group and small group. Um, whole group, we might be teaching a strategy such as making predictions, um, connections that really everybody needs to hear and work on. In small group, it's really a time for me to hone in on a, um, a small group of children where we can practice those strategies, just in a smaller setting where. I can get a feel for how they're practicing it and how they use it, or maybe it's a strategy that that particular small group needs to work on um, that maybe other children don't need to. So we make our small groups depending on like um, their reading levels and we assign them that way. Um, we assign them a text to read, so during the week, during Daily Five, they'll go and read their short text um, and then they'll come back and, and we'll have a discussion about it. Um, the strategies that we are teaching, we use the CAFE. CAFE stands for Comprehension, Accuracy, Fluency, and Expanding Vocabulary. So the strategies that we're teaching are, are linked to those topics. Um, we use read-alouds a lot in the classroom to model those strategies. So for example, right now we're focusing on literary um, elements of stories, and we just read Enemy Pie, um, and then we discussed you know, the characters and the plot, and I did that first with the group, and then they'll come into small groups and we'll continue to practice that. Um, independent Daily Five choices, as the other guys have talked about, um, Daily Five, um, for example, Read to Self, Listen to Read. <coughs> it's the same in second grade, however, we're introducing more choice. We're um, giving the, the students like an independent um, choice board, and they can choose which activities they'd like to do on which day. And we do that because we want them to start making good choices for themselves. So if they've got a book in their book bag that they love and they want to share it to a friend, then they can choose buddy reading for their choice and, and share it with somebody. Similarly, if we've got a spelling test on Friday, they can choose word work on a Thursday <coughs> or maybe on Friday morning to practice those words. So it's giving them choice and helping them understand why they're making we'll start doing book clubs with our second graders. This is where um, they get to choose the text that they like. Um, they get into a small group. They're assigned a job for the week and a certain amount of reading to do. It might be that they are making connections. Another person in their group might be studying character traits. And when they get back together, they'll discuss the pages that they read and they'll discuss what they found when they were doing their little job that week. And it's really a way to start building um, student-led conversations about a text. 
rather than it being teacher focused, having um, putting it on them to talk about the text. Um, we also do genre studies, so for example, right now we're doing a realistic fiction. Um, it's really an opportunity for us to just look at different genres throughout the year. They experience different books of that genre, and they also um, start to learn the traits that books of those genres typically follow. Um, our reading homework in second grade, we assign 10 minutes of reading homework three times a week, but we really do need them to be reading as much as possible at home. Every night would be perfect, yeah. Um, the second graders are really getting to that point now where they, they're starting to foster that independent love of reading. So they want to go and read a book to themselves in their head, which is lovely and it's great and encouraged, but we also need them to continue reading out loud to parents. Because they need to hear, you guys need to hear their accuracy accuracy and fluency, um, their expression, what do they sound like, and you'll only get that if they are reading aloud to you. And um, we also expect or hope that you guys can read to them because they hear you using accuracy and fluency and great expression and they can then learn to model that back. Um, our class updates in second grade that we post every two weeks tell, um, tell you about the strategies that we've been focusing on in reading lessons. So if you're thinking, oh, I don't really know what to talk about with my child, have a look on our class pages and they'll give you some pointers on things that you can discuss. So for example, my update last week was about making connections and predictions and that's something you can go home and continue to practice with your child. Um, I have a couple of pictures of our daily five. Um, we've been focusing a lot on metacognition recently, about thinking about your thinking as you read. Um, so we were holding up speech bubbles um, and telling each other, you know, or thought bubbles, I should say, you know, I'm thinking, I'm recognizing, I'm noticing, I'm feeling. Um, another example of these guys are a buddy reading. Um, we encourage them to sit, you know, elbow to elbow, knee to knee. They can each see the pictures, they can each listen to each other. Um, inside voices, we're not screaming at each other when we're sat next to each other reading. Um, and then we also um, encourage the children to find a comfy spot. So this is a picture of Miss Coyle's class. We have them sat in some baskets and some chairs. Um, because, you know, when I like to read, I like to sit somewhere comfortable. So the children do too. Um, and an example here of him doing some journal writing. But Daily Five is a great way for them to be practicing their reading, writing, and spelling skills throughout the week. Like Mrs. Corbett said, they're doing it every day. <coughs> and that's me. Thank you. Sharon, would you like to say anything before I sort of... Um, sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to say this one. I don't think this one's mine. I don't think mine is making the reading fun. I know what all these wonderful people do, um, but hearing it in an alignment to this morning just makes me feel even prouder to be a part of this community because it's awesome what's going on here. Um, and just... Um, just before you continue, does everyone know who Sharon Alexander is? So Sharon is actually our literacy coach, right? So she helps the teachers and the students. Um, and she will take small groups out. She will come into the class, sort of push into the class to work with the class. Um, she does a lot in the, in the background, that you, so you don't possibly know who she is. That's why I thought we were better to introduce you. Um, but she basically supports the teachers with all of what's going on. And you'll have noticed that um, in our lower school, uh, Joan Centre through First, we have two teachers in every class. The reason we have two teachers is because we have such a focus on literacy, so that we can do a lot of reading, a lot of small group. You also can't see from a still picture, but Shannon and I and Kelly, we get to see this. We walk into classes that are humming with activity, but every student is engaged. And students are doing different things independently of each other, but are, are really doing a lot of rich activities. Um, and part of that, Sharon is in the background, helping them with that, getting that established, supporting the teachers, supporting small groups. Sometimes she works with a, a small group with a specific problem going on that need extra help, but oftentimes she'll be working to extend a group. So maybe a group of second graders who are reading above level and she might do a, 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 book, a book study with them or something just to keep them engaged and push <coughs> them on. So it's not all about remediation, it's about giving support whatever that support looks like. Would that sum up yes. what you do? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, making reading fun. Um, read together every day. I mean, the, all the things that these men and women have been telling us. Build your child's vocabulary.
vocabulary by talking about interesting words and objects. If you read a book about animals, talk about the last time you went to the zoo, or you know, if you read a book about grandparents, just really get that vocabulary going and um, you know, connect it to what's um, going on with your child's um, life. Now, one thing I like to do, and this might be a little higher for some, but I think the more you hear it, they might hear it the first time and get it. They might hear it the fifth time and get it. Anytime you can bring in multiple meanings of words, give them that opportunity, like the word duck. They know duck, and they know the animal. If you say, you know, hey, we're gonna duck out of here. Do you know what that means? It's amazing when you start using those words, what they will start to talk about, like slip. I mean, they don't know it was uh, something we used to wear under our dresses, because nobody <laughs> does, but pink slip, slip of the tongue, you know, all they know is that. Um, park, place you play, park your car. Um, just anytime you can bring in that, because the more words they have, the more they're gonna talk about, the more they're gonna write about. Um, so that is something I, I love to do with them, is bring in multiple meanings. Um, and just model how much you love reading. They adore us, you, and they want to be like us. If they see that we value reading and how much, and not just, you know, reading social media on your phone or whatever, but, you know, actually reading um, is awesome. And just be interactive um, with them. Like they all said, ask them about the, the, you know, questions. How do you think Clifford feels, you know? Why do you think he made that choice? Or just, you know, really be involved. Because, you know, where your child is phonetically reading is not where they are cognitively reading. So they really, it's really important to build their fluency and let them read books that are gonna help their fluency. But it's also important to enhance their cognitive ability if your son is really into baseball or, you know, and they can't read a book about the World Series because it's too hard for them phonetically, read it to them. Read those books that are above their cognitive um, level and talk to them about it. Make sure they understand what they're reading. Um, I love this one um, for the ones that are just starting to read. I tell them all the time, go and read to your stuffed animal, your doll, they will never correct you. Um, <laughs> And they're like, really, I can do that? I said, yes. Um, try to fit reading in any time you have the opportunity. If you have a bag in your car and you're waiting at the doctor's office or the dentist's office or you know, a bag for the restaurant, um, just really, really showing the importance. I mean, one thing I say all the time is readers are leaders. And um, you, know, you, you can't do anything if you can't read. Um, and uh, video them reading. Lord knows they like to see pictures of themselves and videos. <laughs> so, you know, they're little, um, I bought a little tripod for I think $25 at Target and it, uh, I can put my phone in it and I will video some uh, kids that I work with and small groups and they love to watch themselves and hear themselves um, back and um, just, Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. Um, read to your child, with your child, every day. Um, I didn't look at any of my notes, so I hope I said it all. <laughs> I would just like to kind of talk a little bit about what happens next, so third and fourth, right? My background before I became administration, my background was I was a language arts teacher. I taught upper elementary and middle school language arts. And one of the things that I think is really interesting when you teach the upper grades and middle school kids is, I had no idea when my students walked into my classroom whether they learned to read when they were three or they were eight. No idea. And that's one thing I think you really need to be aware of when we're in the moment, is reading isn't a race, it's a process. <coughs> learning to read like learning to do anything is it happens when it's gonna happen. It happens when you're developmentally ready to make it happen. And so one of the worst things we can do with our kids is try to push something when they're not ready. So always be aware of that. And that's when the teachers are sending home leveled readers. They're sending those home because they've done, they've invested some time in assessment, 
in talking, in working with your kids, and they know this is kind of where they're at right now. Now, can they read other books? Absolutely. And so the book bags are going to contain a whole bunch of stuff in there. There's going to be books they can't read by themselves because they have chosen that <coughs> from the library. They've chosen it somewhere else. That's fine. They can read by looking at the pictures. They can read by asking you to read something for them, and that's perfectly fine. So just know that when you get to be a, a teacher in the upper grades, you've no idea that this kid struggled with reading for three years. You've got no idea because these kids come in and they're all reading. So at sixth grade, seventh grade, the kids are reading. Just like they learn to get out of diapers, they will learn to read, <laughs> right? It's the same idea, but we somehow get really stressed about it. And what I want to say to you is don't stress, especially here at AOS, because we have great people and we have our kids, luckily, from age three right through eighth grade. So we have a long time to make this work, right? So don't worry, that's the big message. In third and fourth grade, we move exactly on from where, where the kids are at. Um, we go more into chapter books. Let me tell you that even if you have a struggling reader, by third grade, they will be reading chapter books. I can tell you that right now, even though you might think, oh gosh, it's not happening for me. It will happen because a lot of support is being given to reading, for reading. And even if this is the third grade book that they've just finished, this is the fourth grade and they're still in the middle of it right now, this is done with the, stu with the students together. So there's class books that they do together and children get support and they learn how to decode and encode and be excited. They use a lot of time discussing with each other about the books. This one was done as a class and now they're going on to do mysteries in lit circles as I was called them, but what, what do book study, what do you call book clubs. book clubs. So in my old fashioned way, I still call them lit circles, but they're book clubs now, right? Mm -hmm. So that means the kids get to choose and maybe they get some teacher guidance in choosing a book that's kind of at their level so that they can really contribute to that group. So there's a lot of things that are done still. We're still teaching reading after second grade, right? But it's kind of different. But one of the things I will say as, an, as a teacher who taught the upper grades is kids love social time. One of the mistakes we make with reading is making it private. If you can keep reading social for as long as possible, and that's what teachers do with the book clubs, other people are reading, they're sharing ideas, they're sharing, now it's exciting. I want to know what my girlfriends think about the book too after we read this chapter. I know I'm going to get to chat in class. It's hugely important to kids that they do that. We're social animals, right? So it's really important. So as parents, just be aware of that. As your, ch as your children get older and more independent, they still really do need you. They might think they don't, but they do. So one of the things that I, I have three daughters, one of the things I would do is buy the books they were reading and talk to them at, lunch, at dinner time or in the car, in that carpool line or whatever. So I'm also reading the book. So staying connected with what your kids are reading is huge and showing interest in what they're reading is huge. And there isn't a child. I could sit and read this book to my grown up kids and they would love it, right? Because it's now not just a book. And that's what I'm saying, it's, it's an experience. So make reading about creating those experiences. Make reading about um, loving, loving this activity. Take the stress away, you know? So I might have a, ch a child who's fluency, we're working on fluency. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna model. I'm gonna read loads to my kid that's needing fluency and I'm gonna to listen to their reading and I'm gonna encourage them to read more and more and more. But I'm, I'm hearing that reading is jerky and it's not coming just as it should. That's okay. We practice things we're not good at, we get better at it. There's loads of books on tape, well they're not on tape anymore, but you know what I mean, you can, audio books. So there's nothing wrong 
with kids listening to audiobooks. It's fabulous. Usually great actors are employed to use great voices and, and so on. So again, it adds to the enthusiasm of reading. Books of all sizes and shapes. It's, it is, I mean, the biggest thing for me is I've done this for so long that I, I totally understand as a parent where you get stuck on a level and your focus is all about what's happening right now. Um, you know, I, it's funny for me because I have, you know, my three kids have gone through the whole education <coughs> process, but I was there at, the, at those steps going, oh gosh, will she do this, will she do that? They get there. Let me assure you, they get there, and they have a long time to get there. If, we, if we're here at EOS, you know, by eighth grade, they'll be knocking it out the park, they'll be going off to high school, no one will know whether they were tripping over at reading. Uh, we have huge support here for dyslexic kids, they're all very successful. The dyslexic kids are super smart, because they're working out even other things, that other strategies to help them with reading, okay? So, it's a journey. That's what I would say. Keep it fun, take the stress out, and just have fun, play with it. Play with it as much as possible. I am loving the fact that I'm getting to do it all over again with my little guy. I'm absolutely loving it. I have books, this is one of my favorite guys right now, Matthew Van Fleet. If you've got little people that just love to play with books and, and pull, pull things, you know, so Little Hands and Joan Center. His books are phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, the pig, what, let's, let me show you the pig. It actually even <laughs> dances. I mean, these, these books to me are like gold, right? So he's, one, he's someone that if you're just trying to get kids, boys, right? I have a grandson, I had three daughters. I am seeing a huge difference with boys. Boys are doers. They want to do things. So if you can get books where you do things, guess what? They'll start to like books, because now I can do something in that book, right? So looking for good books. There's another one, Sam's Hamburger, that's the same as, similar to Sam's Sandwich. Uh, this is a great one that I haven't opened because it's a Christmas present. <laughs> uh, Santa's going to bring this one, but it's Days of the Week, right? And a cute, cute version. There's also an octopus, which is on back order, so I haven't bought that one yet. <laughs> um, but there's, it does months of the year. So what I'm saying is, whatever you need to do to hook kids into reading, there's loads of resources. We all know the resources. You know, the pop-up books, the, the flat books for little people. These are all exciting and good. Um, but the biggest thing is just be enthusiastic. Read with your kids, for your kids. They will, even this book here, which is a bit like the Men Fox book for upper grades, The Book Whisperer. Basically what she says is, you learn to read by reading, right? Simple. The more you read, the more time you spend doing it, the better you'll be at it. So encouraging reading at all times. You know, we get a little bit um, screen time focused. Let's get back to bringing those books out, especially in the elementary, especially in the lower elementary. Um, it's, it's really important. And books can be used by everyone at all levels. I said, you know, these book boxes of books are mine. I didn't teach little people. I have never taught early childhood. No, thank you. Right? <laughs> Not my thing. I taught upper elementary and middle school for a reason, because that's what I connected with, right? But I love learning about how do you get these kids to read? And let me tell you, there's no one way for every child. We know that phonetics helps with reading, but some kids read without phonics. They just somehow morph into reading. I tell this story because it's, it's true. I have three daughters and I had them in three years. Crazy. So my youngest daughter was ba basically raised herself because we were running around with the two older ones. She was reading at three. No one taught her to read. She picked up books. The other two were getting the book bag sent home 
and she would hear the, her sisters doing it. And she was doing it kind of by copy. Really, she was copying, right? But then we would trick her by <coughs> trying to say, you know, a different book. And she would read it. So we thought, how did, how did that happen? Now, I tell you this story not to say this is the genius child, because that's not the case. She isn't the genius child, and, you know, so, so what at the end of the day? The other two didn't learn to read like that. But what I'm saying is we send kids to school, so we, we, put, we put all the blocks in place. They're doing all the activities that help kids to read. But sometimes kids read despite us, <laughs> you know, just because. And some kids will fight it, and that's okay, because we know they're going to be okay by upper elementary and middle school. So I hope that lets you go. The other thing is, I have all these books, even though I taught upper elementary, because big kids love picture books. Adults love picture books. I still spend way too much money on books. Um, but that's true too. So if you have a child and you're saying, oh gosh, they keep going back to their old favorites, they keep going back to picture books, don't worry about it. That is a comfort, it's a good thing, um, it's fun. I actually read The Pout Pout Fish to my faculty maybe a couple of weeks ago because of the message in the book, right? About having the happy face instead of the pouty face. Um, and it was, it was something that we were talking about, right? Because we all get caught up with life and activities and, and things like that. But it's so funny because I bought this just yesterday at the, the book fair. I, didn't ha I have lots of stuffed toys as well. I have a problem, my husband <laughs> says, I have a problem. Uh, even my daughter thinks I have a problem. <laughs> she said, Mom, you have a problem. I know, I do have a problem. But I bought this yesterday, right, at the book fair, which reminded me about this book. And what's really cool is, and I didn't, I don't have it with me, but my grandson will be two in, Two in January, so he's not he's not two yet. But he goes, he'll say, Balab, Balab, Balab. <laughs> exactly how I say it, mm -hmm. right? He will go, that's when I know he wants pout pout fish. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is we read this together and he's not yet two and he's copying me in this. It's the same, he'll say, row, row, for row, row, row the boat, right? So I know he's not talking in sentences, but he's communicating. And so from a very early age, kids are looking at you and what you're doing and associating you with things, right? So we can do lots of things here at school. We have great resources at EOS, but we need you to do your part as the team that teaches the kids, right? And reading is the gift that will help them in every subject area. So if we can get reading down, if we can make it pleasurable, if we make it fun, this is the best gift you will ever give to your kids. So we hope you got something from this. We have, we're gonna give you some resources as well to look up, but we're here to answer answer questions that you have uh, if if you want to start throwing them out now if not you can email us any one of us very happy to to go further so i'm opening it up to questions